Welcome to Christ Community Church. It's Sunday, June 14, 2015. A sermon by Pastor Newton Fairweather. I want to just first of all give honor to God who is the center and the grace of our lives, who leads us and guides us. I want to give honor to, um, to Pastor Rich giving us the opportunity and our consistory and our church the opportunity just to say a few words this morning. Uh, what God has laid in our hearts, uh, what we've observed over the uh, several months that we've had an opportunity to be blessed to be here. I uh, want to thank my gracious wife who continues to be just a wonderful uh, uh, partner. And uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of looking beyond all my perfectness, and um, <laughs> I'm just joking, y'all. I ain't perfect. I'm just joking. <laughs> and uh, and uh, but I thank God for Sister Fairweather, who who is just a, just a tremendous partner in studying and praying together. And uh, of course, uh, Jerron and Joy for uh, putting up with their impossible dad. So we thank you for being there. Okay, give it some time. 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 Time is important. Recently, um, several surveys uh, revealed some things. Uh, focus on the family, one of the surveys that we had looked at, uh, as well as the Barna Research Group and the 2012-14 Millennial Value Survey revealed several things about three groups in the church. Uh, baby boomers, 65 plus, uh, Generation X, 40 plus, uh, the millennials born between 1980 and 2000, uh, not to even mention the post-pre-millennials. When spoken to the millennial millennials, the latest group, the youngest group, revealed the following data. I'm using millennials, the youngest group, as, as, the, uh, as the sample group because they're the most recent, the youngest group. You know, that group that always tell you, I know. Um, let me keep going. <laughs> uh, it's, it reveals several things. The, the church is the, in the last decade among the millennials, the youngest group, uh, has grown from the unchurch of leaving the church has grown from 44 to 52 percent. Uh, Seventy-five percent of millennials agree, in, in spite of leaving the church, uh, that present-day Christianity has good values and principle. Okay, but a strong but a strong majority also agree that modern-day Christianity is a, is the following: a very revealing data that that fifty-eight percent says that the church is hypocritical. Uh, 62% said the church is judgmental. Again, the millennial, the youngest group that is currently in the church. While this information might be troubling that of the sum, all is not lost. Okay? Like generation before the millennials, the generation X and the baby boomers, these concerns have always been among generations. It's nothing new. At one time or another, the boomers and the Xers to some degree, believe this. Time changes everything. We live in an age, my brothers and sisters, my friends, of instant news, instant connection, TMZ, Twitter. We are connected in so many ways. What's said one minute is then, bam. The next minute, it's all over. It's, all, it's been posted, and everybody knows about it. Uh, our feelings expressed by manila, 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 blah, 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 blah. millennials are not new. Those of who've been around the clock and the block know some things about what they're saying. Here's some of the things that we know, and everybody ought to know, that the church is not perfect. It never was. There's work that comes with change. Christianity does not remove the struggles of life. Millennials know that. And just like you saw your mother and your father go through struggles and strain, they too see their parents going through the same thing. Uh, my brothers and sisters, I'm here to announce to you clearly in the church there's no such thing as a pew theory. There's no cosmic Santa Claus. I'm sorry. Getting God's people together sometimes can be a challenge. 
Now, 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 it is challenging to get people outside the church together. So when they come in the church together, what makes we think this challenge will be different? The issue, my brothers and sisters, is not getting people in the church. The issue is getting people, the church, in the people. That's the challenge. You can pack it out if you want to. And so I say to you again this morning, give it some time. Look at your neighbor and say, give it some time. Young brothers and sisters say, give it a whole lot of time. <laughs> the Bible clearly says that there's a time and a place for everything. Come on. The Bible is serious about time. Look around you. Nothing move or grow without time. When you look in the mirror, time. Look at your kids, time. Nothing moves without time. And so the question for us, what is God doing in time? The text is a very important. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you what the text revealed to us as we grow in, in order to move forward because this applied to our lives, it applied to the church, but it also applied to what are you going to do? Have you ever wondered what is God doing in time, with time? It gets scary. It gets shaky sometimes. And so we say, what is, what is God doing? No one comes in the presence of the discovery and it, well, in the presence of God without walking by faith. Faith suggests to us, and not by sight, time. Anybody know what I'm, I'm talking about? His plans are in his word. And his word takes time to implement. And that's why we have to give it some time. I know we walk by faith, but I still need some answers. I don't read my Bible like I should, but I still have some, I need some answers. I got a lot of whys in my life. I need some answers. The tech teaches us several things, several things about this thing called time, but it also says you have to give it some time. The first thing you notice in the text as you read the text is verse 24b. It says that the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. There are some good things in Christ's community. It's easy to see some negative things, but there are some good things in Christ's community. Because why? Because God, what owner you know is going to sow none but bad things in his church? There's some good folks at Christ's community. It's not what naysayer says, and that you're going to find a lot of those. You should be able to say something good about your church. Let me tell you some good things if y'all want to hear it. For years, you've done a fabulous job with your VBS. Let me say that again. You've done a fabulous job with your BVS. I love my Sunday school class. I give a special shout out, shout out to that Sunday school class at 830. We have a good time with the ladies. And I heard they had a better good time without me this morning. Make me mad, but that's cool. I guess they had a better, better teacher than me. My, my wife helped this morning, but that's okay. The Wednesday night Bible study, the Wednesday night breakfast. I don't care if two people show up. That's something to celebrate. You see what the young adults are doing? You see the stage they hooked up in the back? They're ready to rock and roll. They're going to put on a for sure enough good gathering in the back when that time's come. You feed 90 to 100 people, 500 plus per month with your food ministry on Saturdays. You partner. You partner with folks to do that. That's a part of what you do. That's why you tell your story. If you don't tell your story, somebody else will tell your story. There's some good things that you have happening here. There's some good seeds. Toot your own horn sometimes. 
You've kept the doors open. You kept the AC on. You call a pastor. You've been through some tough times. You've been through some valley. And the Lord has been on your side. Tell your story. The text also established kingdom ownership of the field. The farm has an owner. The church has an owner. It's God. God knows the land. He knows the field. He knows the potential and the possibility of the land, of the church, of the house. But here's the interesting part about it. Verse 25 goes on to say, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. Things happen when you sleep too much. What do I mean by sleeping too much? When you're not praying, you're sleeping. When you're not studying the word of God, you're sleeping. Little prayer, little power. Sometimes God will allow things to happen in your life in order to get your attention. You have to be tested. You have to be tried. God gold standard does not come without a test. God tests you in order not to make you bitter, but to make you better. God tests you in order to let you understand that this thing that I'm about to do with you require that you have some toughness. No cross, no crown. Unless a man deny himself, take up and cross and follow me, you must do that. In spite of our failures, brothers and sisters, we still have favor. In spite of our troubles, our troubles don't have us. Because God has us in his hand. And is whatever is in God's hands, no one can take out. He knows how much you can handle. He knows how much you can bear. So when you're going through and you're dealing with the issues in the church, because of the church, know that God sees it all. God knows what you can bear. And when God is the owner, no matter what happened in my life, help me somebody, that when I have an owner like Jesus, that says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. When I have an owner like Jesus that walks with me and talks with me, I know it's going to be all right. When I have an owner that, like Jesus, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I know he's with me. When I have an owner, even though when I get tell no, I know what God says. God, I got to hear what God has to say. We have to learn how to give it some time. It's amazing now. We pray and we want them instantaneous answer. This ain't Twitter. You can't Google a blessing. Help me somebody. Come on. You can't Facebook a blessing. Lord, have mercy. Let me keep going. God knows what he's doing. God is in charge. That's why I know without a shadow of a doubt that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Brothers and sisters, give it some time. Millennials, young people, give God a chance to do work with what you've asked him for. If you ask him for something, don't settle for less. When you ask God, to those much is given, much is required. When you got to ask God for much, you got to wait for much. You can't just expect it. You, God, 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 you have to prove to God that you can handle the blessing. And God is not going to open up the windows of heaven and give you a Mercedes, give you all this when you have not learned to handle the Ford. I love some Ford, but you got to learn to handle that. Change the oil, clean the car, do something with it. And if you can't handle that, don't expect the other stuff. Let me go, let me keep going. 
there was a difference between what the workers were seeing and what the owner is seeing. This laid-back attitude of the parable exposes an owner who's laid back. He's not in a hurry. He's seeing something different from what all of us is seeing. Lord, he said, wait a minute now. You, you know, they say, you know what this is happening, so sometimes they're in a hurry. So let's, let's get this stuff. Let's, let's throw it out. But the owner's laid back. Oftentimes, we don't see in each other what God sees in us. We don't know each other's stories like God knows our story. We don't know where God has brought us from and where God has taken us to. The church has wheat and it has tears. As long as there are people in the church, you will have both. Because each of us in us have some wheat and some tears. Yeah, you look good this morning. But, but I'm, 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 I'm going to send a drone to follow you the rest of this week and see what you like on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm going to see what you like when somebody cut in front of you and you say those fabulous four-letter words that cannot be said. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a drone follow you this week and see what happens. Now, guys, don't be looking up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But, 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 but we're not, we have some stuff in us. One of the things that the text brings to our attention clearly says, don't be so judgmental. Don't be so judgmental. The workers wanted to go and get it done right away. Let us do it now. One of the things that we have to learn in order to avoid being judgmental is learn how to pray more. Talk to God a little bit more. How can you say, brothers and sisters, not my will, but thy will be done, and you're ready to act based on your answer? Don't be so quick. Pray about it. See what God is trying to tell you. I've learned that when God gives me an answer, you can't beat that answer. When God tells me yes, I celebrate. When God tells me no, I celebrate. When God tells me to wait, I celebrate. Any answer from God is a good enough answer for me. Why? Because I know his answers work. Oftentimes, most of, all, most of us, we take it personal. When somebody says no, no doesn't mean no. No simply means that, okay, God, what do you say? Look at what Matthew chapter 1 verses through 4 says. It's interesting. And in the church, what we have is wheat and tears. It says, judge not, ye not that ye not be judged. For with what judgment he judge, he shall be judged. And with what measure ye made, it shall be measured to you again. And why behold is the moth in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thy own eyes. That's why it's so important. We judge and we look at things through lenses of imperfection. Lenses that have some stuff in it. Sometimes you got to clean your lens. Sometimes you got to take the word of God and say, you know, I got to clean this out. Lord God, give me, give me some patient knobs here. Give me some love in my lens. G give me some reading in my lens. You need some of that in your lens in order to see things in the right way. They're looking at the field from their perspective of imperfection, but in order to see what God has seen, you got to put some love in there. And Jesus was the same way. Lord, have mercy. There is danger, brothers and sisters, write this down if you want, in premature harvesting. Premature harvesting. In, in other words, we, we're trying to, before it's time, don't write conclusion on each other. Don't write conclusions on each other. Give it some time. Man looks at the outside, but God looks where? At the what? Give it some time. Each of us in this room, 
sometimes, somewhere in our lives, whether we won 90, 20, 40, 50, 30, 18, 15, sometimes in our lives could have been uprooted. But somebody gave us some time. Folks wrote some scripts about your life based on what they saw. And I'm still writing stuff about you based on what they see. Friends have written stuff about you based on what they see. Read your Facebook where they talk about you. Read all the mother books where they talk about you. You won't be any good. Ah, uh, you're a chatterbox. You talk too much. I'm going to unfriend you. I, 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 I in the world. I, I just, how can you unfriend somebody? I don't understand that part. I'm still wrestling with that. Jesus never gave up on people. He gave them a chance to get it together. In other words, he gave them some time. The woman at the well gave some time. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he gave them some time. Dying with, with thieves and robbers, giving them time. Giving them some time to get themselves together. Just like the enemy has a plan to destroy us, God has a plan to save us. Verse 30 is interesting. It says, interesting, he says, let them both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reaper, gather them, ye together the first tears, and bind them in a bundle to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. There is a time coming. But God has a plan. Not my time, but God's time. Not my answer, but God answers. Eve was a part of the world. Make no, make, make, for fact, it is. But God has a plan as a timing when he will put his plan into play. Why? Because he's the owner. God has a plan. God has a plan for the boomers, the Generation X, the millennials, the post-millennials. But God has a plan. Philippians 1 and 6 says this clearly. Be confident of this very thing, that he which begin a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I mean, you see, the, the beauty of this thing that in church you got all of this mess, all of this stuff, and, and God says, I begin a work in it. That means I'm going to bring this thing to where I want it to be. I'm going to bring it to the conclusion. I've determined the time, the place, the who, the what, why, where, when. I've determined it. You cannot do that. God says, I've done this. And I've got to trust his word. Why? Because he says, heaven and earth may pass away, but my word shall not. So when, when, when you see stuff in your life that you do not like, remember this. Keep on praying. When you get tired, pray some more. When you're frustrated, pray some more. When you don't like it, pray some more. When you see things going awry, pray some more. That means you're not praying hard enough. Why? Because I firmly believe, brothers and sisters, young or old, boomers, millennials, whatever you may be, that prayer changes You don't like what you see? Pray harder. Zip it up and pray harder. You don't like folks? Pray harder on them. They make you mad? Pray harder. Are you saying that there's anything impossible for your God to do? I can't say one thing and keep doing it. I can't say something I don't believe in is going to happen, but yet I keep doing it. And God had a plan for the wheat and the tear. It says, he that begins... You see, the, 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 what gives you what makes you optimistic, what makes you excited that he says he began, it is a good work. Think about that. Now I can see, you see the enemy began, Mike, a bad work in the field. But, but, but it says that he that began a good work, and notice now the owner planted good seeds. 
a good work. The enemy planted bad seeds. So he that began a good work in you will bring it to his conclusion. Whatever generation that fits you, this text screams at you and brings your attention that every generation is looking for Jesus. Every generation must understand that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the master except by him. Every generation must understand that Jesus is the way. Every generation is, is, must understand that Jesus is not interested in to separate the wheat from the tear. Jesus is not interested in separation of black from white. Jesus is not interested in separating generation from generation. Jesus is not interested in separating gender from gender. Jesus is not interested in separating rich from poor. Jesus is not interested in separation of denomination from denomination. Jesus is not interested in what man is trying to do. Separation is a man's objective and not God's objective. No one can tell me when I get to heaven, I don't know about your objective, but my objective is to get to heaven. I just believe in my heart that I will not be able to bring my small bank account with me. I believe I'm going empty. I believe I'm going to see my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I believe without a shadow of a doubt. I love my family, but I got to go. And when I got to go, I go. But I do believe they're going to come with me before or after. But I do believe that. I believe I can't take my reputation with me. Thank God. God for that. I believe I can't take what I was with me. I believe I can't take nothing with me. They're going to lay me in a grave somewhere, but my life says to be present, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so I don't believe that one of the reasons he says, because I, I, I got to practice non-separation here because when I get there, I practice it here for what happened there because I'm not going to have all of this up there. Jesus is saying in the parable that I ain't having it up there. You can have it down here, but you got to get it together here. This is rehearsal, y'all. This is strict up rehearsal. My brothers and sisters, people change. People change. Remember that. We move from a spirit as we grow in Christ from a spirit of judgment to discernment. Discerning what the Holy Spirit is telling us. The wheat and the tear. Before you, before you make a judgment, get some discernment. All of sin and falling short of the glory of God. Jesus stood on the cross and said, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. John 3, 16 and 17 say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, rich or poor, pretty or good looking, ugly or whatever, <laughs> that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's an opportunity for the wheat and the tear. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The field called the world. God is at work. Jesus says unto them, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He gives us the mission to not to make judgment, not to write conclusion, but to tender his field. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you even until the end of the world. God owns the field. Our job is not to judge the field. 
Our job is to teach them about a Jesus that can change them. Your job description, no matter what the feel, is not to judge people. It's not to tell them what they are not, but to tell them what God can do for them. Because what God has done for you, in spite of you, not that you were so good, he changed you. He showed up in your life, opened some closed doors in your life, turned you around in the midnight hour, no matter who you were and what you were, and made a difference in your life. Our job is to tell folks, Lord have mercy, yeah, you look like a wheat, but you're right next to, oh, you're a tear, but you're right next to some wheat. Is, is it maybe because God has given the wheat some authority? And that as, as, as stuff that ain't no good get closer to stuff that is good, that just maybe, just, you know, you know, maybe if I hang around with some good folks, some folks that go in places, some folks that's going to speak some positive things in my life, some folks that are going to tell me, I know you made a mistake, but let me show you how to do the right thing. Just maybe if I hang with some folks that are going to speak some positive things in my life that, that tells me I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I, I know you, got your, you lost your job. I, I know you're on your last track. But just maybe if I get some folks that put their hands around me and don't judge me. They know my record, but they put their hands around me. They know, and they're going to say, you know what? I'm going to help you because I know what? The more I give, the more I'll receive. I'm going to help you because to those much is given, much is required. I know I'm not hearing what I want to hear, but I know what God has done for me. And just maybe you have become a wheat when you was a tear. Because you're starting to hang, you know, you're starting to hang with some folks that's going places. Some going to rub off on you. Right, Z? <laughs> some going to rub off on you. Come on. Either some good stuff or some bad stuff. But, but if I hang around enough, wheat, some Christian folks. And that's why I tell young people, hang with some young folks that love the Lord, want to go some places. They're not perfect. But hang with some folks. Hang with folks that you see that can model for you what Christ We good dude. That's, uh, that's one of my Cleveland fans. But 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 <laughs> but God is able. Christ community, you have wheat and tear in this church. If you don't have it, it's coming. You come out on Saturday, you see a whole bunch of that. <laughs> I'm challenging you. Move out to your comfort zone. Move out of your comfort zone. You see, what God does when he makes you uncomfortable, he's trying to tell you something. You don't come to the house of God to be comfortable. You come to the house of God to be uncomfortable because God's going to stir something inside of you. Change don't come without some tension. And what you feel when you're in the house of God is God says, now, nah, you see it, you make a difference. I don't, want to, I don't want to hear about who ain't making a difference. I want you to make a difference. You don't like it? Make a difference. Make a difference. Because the paymaster is not this. The paymaster is God. Why? Because he's the owner of this bad boy. He's the owner of everything, and we will have to answer to that. Boomers, Xers, millennials, you got the best. It's coming. You got to step up to the plate and say, Lord, renew me, remake me. There's no way, there's no way in God heaven's field that failure can be put on you if you, do not, if, 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 you, if you do not allow it, you can encourage yourself, speak to yourself. If nobody does it, you do it to yourself. 
Young people, the devil is a lie. Don't ever let nobody tell you you were a failure or you're going to be a failure. Don't you ever. I don't care how much you love her. Somebody tell you you're a failure, you look at them and smile and says, but God. You're not going to make it, you're going to say, but God. You're going down. Listen, I'm, if I'm going down, I'm going down saying, but God, but God, but God, but God. I remember a guy was sinking and he hollered, Jesus! And he saved him. Bow your heads with me real quickly. I just believe all things are possible. Craziness of life say all things are possible. Because God is the owner. God has invested in me, invested in you. He's put something inside of you that no demon or devil can take out. He's put success in you. He's put smarts in you. And what God has put inside of you, nobody can take out. So, Father God, this morning, Lord, I know the room is full of some caterpillars. But Lord, we ask you for butterflies. Lord, I just believe you're going to make a change in some of us. And you've already done it. We just don't see it. We're in the moment of tension, in the moment of valleys. But Lord, there is a mountaintop coming that nobody can see but you. And so Lord, I just ask you to remove the scales from their eyes that they can see that those that are for them are greater than those that are against them. Lord, we declare this morning that the battle is the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. Father God, give us a spirit of joy. In this world, we'll have trouble, but you've given us joy, unspeakable joy. And the joy of the Lord made remind in us. The joy that you've given us, the world can't give it to us, and the world can't take it away from us. Lord, we thank you for the joy. We want to relax. We want to, we want to just relish in the joy of the Lord. And when we relish in the joy of the Lord, only thing can come is praise. Lord, give a going up praise right now. Put your hands to give, give God some crazy praise. Come on, clap him, clap him. <laughs> clap him, clap him. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. 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 Come on. Come on. Come on. You want something from God, you must be prepared to do what you've never done before. Give him the glory. Give him the thanks. Amen. Amen. Mm. Amen.